All right, guys, so I don't know if you could tell maybe by my face or maybe a little bit by my voice right now, but I am pretty sick. So I got a couple different Israel updates that I want to get to here with y'all. And um, we're just going to try to power through it. OK, so I'm going to start off here with this Al Jazeera article. Complicity leaders, activists slam the United States for sending more arms to Israel. So I've covered before, obviously, the standard like three point five or three point eight billion dollars that the United States gives to Israel every single year. Then we had that additional package that Biden was trying to get pushed through that, can, you know, carried over like 14 billion dollars in addition to that money going to Israel. And then we also talked about the reports that I think came out from The Guardian, where they were discussing upwards of over 100 sort of under the table weapon shipments that the Biden administration has given to Israel since October seventh where they were keeping the dollar amount of those shipments below a certain threshold so that it didn't have to become publicly available knowledge and then we have this story which is added on to all of those previous ones as well and so i think this is notable for a couple of different reasons here first off they say the united states has green lighted the transfer of a new 2.5 billion dollar weapons package comprising of bombs and fighter jets to Israel, according to US media reports. Despite expressing concern about civilian casualties in Gaza, the White House arms package includes more than 1,800 MK-84 2,000 pound bombs and 500 MK-82 500 pound bombs, according to the Pentagon and the Department of State officials, according to the Washington Post. They also go down here, you know, to discuss basically these 2,000 pound bombs that I've talked about before. Um, you know, Israel has dropped hundreds of these since October 7th. I mean, this article goes all the way back to December. So this is three months out of date. And even at that point, they had already dropped hundreds and hundreds of these 2,000 pound bombs. One of the reasons that this is notable is that this is something that at the time, the U.S. military even came out and said, OK, well, we probably, you know, even with our standards, wouldn't have dropped these kinds of bombs with such a massive radius. It's upwards of like a thousand feet or twelve hundred feet radius in terms of lethality um, that these bombs can inflict. And even the U.S. military was saying we probably wouldn't have even dropped these kinds of bombs in such a densely populated civilian area. And Israel has dropped hundreds of these bombs. And I think the comparison they give here is apt. I mean, CNN says not seen since Vietnam, Israel drops hundreds of 2,000 pound bombs on Gaza. And so these are the kinds of weapons that we're continuing to ship them. I mean, pair this with like, you know, the United States, the Joe Biden administration, the State Department constantly coming out and hand wringing against Benjamin Netanyahu and all of these reports that we get about how frustrated Joe Biden is behind the scenes um, at Benjamin Netanyahu and, and their, you know, over over broad targeting of, of the people of Gaza. And there's been too many civilian casualties and all of this and that. And then behind the scenes, we're sending them more weapons. We are sending them the weapons that they are using indiscriminately, in the words of Joe Biden himself, against the people of Gaza. So again, you cannot come out and publicly pretend as if you desperately care about innocent Palestinian lives that are being lost or being taken by Israel, and then turn around and give them just an unlimited tap of some of the most lethal weapons that we have in our arsenal, and, and hand them over with no strings attached. It's a complete discrepancy. It's a, a perfect dichotomy between the rhetoric of the Biden administration versus the actions of the Biden administration. And um, we've been saying, obviously, for a long time that that would be the first step that anybody who wanted to reign in Israel would take is to cut off the weapons. I mean, this is something that the UN Special Rapporteur that I talked about a couple days ago was mentioning, that there needs to be a total arms embargo on Israel right now, on top of potential sanctions, on top of a whole host of other, you know, policies that the international community should be putting into play right now in order to force them to stop this genocide. And yet the Biden administration is doing the complete opposite of that. They are pretending as if the UN special rapporteur saying that it's, uh, you know, likely that Israel is in the midst of committing a genocide is uh, irrelevant. They're saying that the ICJ case brought by South Africa is meritless and, and counterproductive. I mean, this is what the U.S. State Department has been doing. We covered they put out that report outright saying Israel is following international law. They're not blocking humanitarian aid. I mean, contradicting the United Nations, every major human rights organization, even the government of Israel, even the government of the United States, because we're building that port. For what reason? Well, to specifically get around the Israeli blockade of aid from getting into Gaza. 
And so they just try to gaslight the hell out of people over and over and over again and expect that people aren't going to notice. And so here we have a perfect encapsulation of that with uh, Prem Thacker from The Intercept, who was asking about this recent State Department report where Israel signed a letter and Pinky promised and said, we're not violating international humanitarian law. And um, let's just listen to this back and forth here because this was just absolutely insane. And then just on the assurances, you know, earlier you said after receiving assurances from Israel that they're not violating humanitarian law, the U.S. so far has not seen proof of that. I'm wondering what these assurances look like, because, you know, we have all seen proof from the International Court of Justice, from the United Nations, and from footage, especially the past few weeks, over and over again of Israel seemingly targeting civilians, hospitals, churches, footage even yesterday showing Israeli forces seeming to execute unarmed Palestinians waving white flags. They're blocking aid to the point that the U.S. is trying to build a peer to deliver aid as if Israel is a belligerent and not an ally. So with all of this, how is Israel not violating humanitarian law? Are these assurances just Israel saying that they promise they're not so, and they evidently continue to do so? So I, spo so I spoke to this uh, extensively on Monday and Tuesday, and I would encourage you to, to check the transcript. I'll do a little bit of it again, but I don't think I think I will spare everyone else here 15 or 20 minutes of me uh, in vain on the national security memo again. But what I will say is... Um, uh, we received assurances from the government of Israel that are consistent with the requirements of the national security memo. Now, uh, but I think to your underlying question, we look at those assurances um, through a lens of the ongoing processes that we have to answer this very question. And we do have question, we do have processes going on examining um, specific incidents in the um, uh, in the conduct of the campaign, and. Uh, those processes are ongoing. They've not reached a, a, a final uh, determination at this point. I mean, what do you even what do you even say? We have ongoing processes, and these processes are still processing, and so we haven't reached a final process, but we are uh, seriously engaged in these processes in order to figure out what the processes are moving forward on the process. I mean, that's what he just said there. Fucking meaningless. Completely void of any substantive response whatsoever. I mean, the, the answer to Prem Thacker's very solid question there, um, where he basically outlines, you know, we, you guys say that Israel is giving these assurances that they're not violating international law, and yet we see on our timelines every single day verifiable examples of them violating international law. How do you square those two things? The answer to that, if, if Matt Miller was an honest actor, uh, would just be to say, yeah, it's a bullshit memo because the United States of America is not legally allowed to send weapons to countries that are blocking humanitarian aid or who are using those weapons to violate international humanitarian law. Israel is doing both of those things, so we can't come out and admit that they're doing those things or else the armed shipments that we are ramping up to them are illegal. That's the honest answer to the question. Of course he can't say that, and so he has to do this stupid fucking workaround where he's saying, well, we have processes that are in place to try to check whether or not they're violating international law and blah 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 until you know the end of time i mean this is what we get over and over and over again i mean it, it really is amazing that we never get any actual follow-up on any of these so-called investigations or these processes right oh we're having difficult conversations with our israeli counterparts and we've asked them about this specific incident and uh, i'm sure they're going to get back to us they never get back to them with anything other than just vague nonsense. Oh, well, we're looking into that. Or uh, we determined that uh, the people who we just struck openly in 4K in broad daylight that were totally unarmed, we determined that they to may have had some you know, connection to Hamas or whatever the case may be. I mean, we see this over and over and over again. And it's just getting... It's getting so tiring. I, I honestly don't even know how guys like Prem Thacker or any of these other journalists like uh, Saeed or like Matt Lee, I don't know how they keep going to these State Department press briefings because you just get the same shit over and over and over again. They never change the, the substance of their response in any way, shape, or form. And so I want to finish off with this because this was some interesting reporting here from uh, Haaretz, obviously an Israeli uh, outlet here. In terms of, uh, I mean, a number of different things here. I mean, one of them is, is just the total chaos that is the IDF uh, forces and how, you know, ill-trained they are or how irresponsible they are in certain circumstances where um, they're basically just shooting to kill anybody who comes across their field of view um, and how there isn't really such a, a top-down hierarchy in the way that you would imagine like the U.S. military may have, um, which obviously I'm a big critic of, but I mean, you, you got to keep in mind, a lot of these IDF guys, a lot of these, especially like newer recruits or people who went over there to go specifically fight in Gaza, like, 
a lot of these guys don't know what the fuck they're doing. I mean, a lot of them are really young. They're probably my age. I'm 24 years old. And they have no idea what they're doing. Some of them, their only experience is, you know, going in and beating the shit out of Palestinian 13-year-olds in the West Bank or whatever. And so now they're, they're thrown into this war zone or whatever and, um, you know, given free reign to act however they want. And so, of course, we're going to see an endless string of TikTok videos of them, you know, violating international law and committing war crimes and all of the above. But this article gets into not just that aspect of it, but also how systemically the Israeli military has inflated their count of how many Hamas militants they've killed versus how many civilians they've killed. So let's just go ahead and jump into it. Israel created kill zones in Gaza. Anyone who crosses into them is shot. So a couple of notable things here. So first off, they're responding to that drone footage that I've talked about numerous different times now where you have the four guys walking unarmed completely in an open area here and you have one drone strike that goes and, and strikes the group directly twice and then you have two guys who are able to somehow walk away from that then they follow up and, and basically do a double and then a triple tap and, and strike the two guys who are able to walk slash crawl away from the initial drone strike. So a pretty obvious war crime. Um, and so they respond to this. They say this, quote, this was a very grave incident a senior IDF officer told Haaretz. They were unarmed. They didn't endanger our forces in the area in which they were walking. So a pretty big admission there. In other words, this is a war crime. They are admitting that this is a war crime. They say, in addition, says an intelligence officer who is familiar with the story, it was not at all certain that they were involved in this, you know, different separate event of somebody la launching a rocket in, you know, remotely the same area. He says that they were simply people who were closest to the launching site. It's possible they were terrorists. It's possible they were civilians out looking for food. Okay, I think we all know what the real situation is here. They say this story is but one example made public in a manner in which the Palestinians are killed by IDF gunfire in the Gaza Strip. The number of dead Gazans is now estimated to be over 32,000, and according to the army, some 9,000 of these are terrorists. So I've talked about this before. Honestly, if I had to guess, and it's, it, this is just pulling this out of my ass based on the numbers that I've seen and how many, you know, the IDF says that they've killed versus how many I get from human rights organizations and et cetera, et cetera. But not, the idea that 9,000 of the 32,000 that they've killed so far, and this number is an underestimate, obviously, but the idea that they've killed 9,000 Hamas militants to me seems patently absurd when you actually look into the details in terms of how they count these numbers. I mean, I, I think they would be lucky to say maybe they've killed 4,000, 5,000 Hamas militants. Now, keep in mind, Israel before October 7th estimated that the Hamas militant wing had about 30,000, 40,000 or so members. So we are now half a year, six months into this, and you've killed maybe 5,000 militants? So 5,000 out of 30,000 or 5,000 out of 40,000? And we're supposed to believe what? That you're on the verge of eradicating Hamas? I mean, what are we really talking about here, guys? I mean, you can look at the recent, these are the Euromed Human Rights Monitor updates here. So this is up until about two weeks ago, March 14th. 40,000 total killed, almost 15,000 of these now being children. And I mean, they say 36,000 out of the 40,000 have been civilians. So this is their count. I mean, they're basically saying maybe 4,000 or so have been, less than 4,000 or so, have been Hamas militants. So I'm, if I say 5,000, I'm really averaging up from some of the other numbers that we're getting here. But they say 9,000. Now, why do they say 9,000 have been killed? Well, they say, however, a host of reserve and standing army commanders who have talked to Haaretz cast doubt on the claim that all of these were terrorists. I mean... They imply that the definition of terrorist is open to a wide range of interpretation. It's quite possible that Palestinians who never held a gun in their lives were elevated to the rank of terrorists posthumously, at least by the IDF. They say, quote, in practice, a terrorist is anyone the IDF has killed in the areas in which its forces operate. This is according to a reserve officer who has served in Gaza. Let me say that again. In practice, a terrorist is anyone the IDF has killed in the areas in which its forces operate. So, I mean, exactly what I was just saying there. And I've talked about this in previous videos, like we, we've broken down the math before. And if you think about it, right, I mean, let's go back to these Euromed numbers here, right? So we know that two thirds, roughly, of those who have been killed have been women and children. It's like 60, 70 percent have been just women and children. So if we're talking about 40,000 or so total that have been killed, two-thirds of those women and children, then to get to a 9,000 Hamas militant killed in action number, 
you would have to assume that like literally every single and then some you know adult male who you have killed in gaza has been a hamas militant which is obviously absurd the idea that israel has not killed any adult male non-combatants is ridiculous we, we've all seen this happen live on camera right over and over and over again and so now you get an understanding in terms of how they come to that number right they're basically just saying we set up some sort of a zone wherever our forces are operating and anybody who comes within that zone we're going to kill them on site and then we are going to assume just by default that they are a terrorist that they are a hamas militant and then boom our number of of hamas militants killed goes up by one right that's how they're calculating these numbers and i mean again they say it's astonishing this is according to one of the same guys it's astonishing to hear the reports after every operation regarding how many terrorists were killed he says you don't need to be a genius to realize that you don't have hundreds or dozens of armed men running through the streets of Khan Yunus or Jabalia fighting the IDF. And he goes on to explain, like, what does this actually look like in practice? And this is what we've seen from even the self-published Hamas videos that have been going around on Telegram and on Twitter and all of the rest of it, which is usually you'll have, you know, a handful of Hamas guys who are operating out of some building and they'll pop in here, pop out there and whatever the case may be, sort of using guerrilla tactics. The idea that, like, you would ever have an instance, like in this drone footage, where you're just going to have four guys walking completely out in the open, and that these are Hamas militants that are all, like, carrying some sort of weaponry to go and, like, walk out into the open towards some Israeli battalion or whatever, is patently absurd. That's not how they've been fighting, and we've all seen that, right? And But yet you'll have them go into the IDF, they'll go into places like Jabalia, or they'll go into places like Khan Yunus, and they'll massacre a bunch of people, and then they'll just say, well, we told you to leave this area, or we established this as a kill zone, and so anybody who we killed within this zone is therefore by definition a terrorist. They are therefore by definition a Hamas militant, right? They say he emphasizes that it's not that we invent bodies, but that no one can determine with certainty who is a terrorist and who is hit after entering the combat zone of an IDF force. In other words, they don't really give a shit about determining whether or not it's a civilian or a combatant. It's just anybody in any particular zone that they happen to be in is a terrorist by default. I mean, Jesus Christ, man, they continue down here. They say the combat zone is the key term. This is an area in which a force sets itself up, usually in an abandoned house, with the area surrounding it becoming a closed military area, but with no clear marking as such. Another term for this is the kill zones. They say, in every combat zone, commanders define such kill zones, says the reserve officer. That means clear red lines that no one who is not in, that is not from the IDF may cross so that our forces in the area are not hit, okay? They say the boundaries of these kill zones are not determined in advance, nor is their distance from the house in which forces operate from are situated. The height of the buildings is also an important factor. Each force has observation posts within and outside the Gaza Strip, whose soldiers are charged with identifying danger, but ultimately... The boundaries of these zones and the exact procedures of operation are subject to interpretation by commanders in that specific area, saying, as soon as people enter it, mainly adult males, orders are to shoot and kill even if that person is unarmed. I mean, again, this is this is something we've seen over and over again. I mean, these are a couple different stories that have come out. This one was just from a couple weeks ago here from the Washington Post. Drone footage raises questions about Israeli justification for deadly strike on Gaza journalists. So this was specifically having to do with, I believe, the son of uh, Wael Dadu, the, uh, one of the chief correspondents from Al Jazeera inside of Gaza, who basically had a huge chunk of his family wiped out by the IDF. And this was one of those strikes that struck, again, I believe his son, Hamza. Um, and uh, basically the Israeli justification was, well, they were using some drones and that drone looked scary to the IDF and so therefore they struck and killed them and then it turns out we get further reporting on it and it's like this is just a commercial drone that many different journalists have been using inside of Gaza to get you know imaging of, of what everything looks like right and they had already gone by the point that they were killed they had already previously gone through multiple IDF checkpoints so they knew exactly who they were and then they basically just lied about it after assassinating these two journalists, right? And again, we've seen it over and over again. This was another clip that I showed you guys recently of these two guys, I mean, one of them carrying a bike, it looked like, just rolling a bike down the street. And um, they, they struck these guys in a drone strike, killed them, and then said, and even published this video where they're outlining the bike as if it's an RPG. And they said that it was some sort of a, a weapon, right? An RPG, and that's why they decided to strike this guy and then lie about it afterwards. But 
I mean, just another instance, it's like, these guys were just walking down the street, calmly, trying to go and get flour. I mean, same as the other guys in the drone footage that we've, we've looked at numerous times now. It's like, even from the IDF's perspective, they should know. This is not how Hamas operates militarily. Like, they're not just walking calmly down the center of a blown-up street, okay? With, with a RPG in hand, just casually looking for some IDF battalion. Like, that's not how this shit fucking works. But they just do this over and over and over again, and, um, you know, nothing is really ever done about it. So I recommend you guys go and read the rest of this piece if you're interested in it. I mean, it just is kind of outlining, again, like the internal chaos of the IDF, the disorganization of the IDF, how, how unprofessional so many of their soldiers and even commanders are, and that they're basically given just free license to do whatever they want. I mean, these kill zones are, are totally illegal, right? And they've effectively done this in, like, the entire northern strip of gaza i mean they claim that oh there's some humanitarian zones here or there but it's i mean it's bullshit we know that they've been striking mosques and churches and hospitals and refugee camps and u.n shelters and schools and everything you know all of the above so we know that that part of it's bullshit but this is effectively what they've done since the the ground invasion is they basically cut the gaza strip in half and they said the entire north needs to be evacuated. Never mind whether or not you have the resources or the physical capability in order to evacuate, everybody has to get out. And so if, if you don't get out, you know, and, and you happen to tread too closely to some IDF battalion, then you are just going to be killed. And then you're going to be lumped in with our success numbers in terms of how many Hamas militants that we've killed since October 7th. And so, I mean, it's a really interesting story, again, for so many different reasons. And meanwhile, of course, we have the United States, the Joe Biden administration, continuing to ship weapons over to Israel in complete violation of not only international law, but also in violation of U.S. domestic law for the reasons that I've outlined. And um, you have guys like Matthew Miller just, com you know, continuing to have to spin themselves in circles and tie themselves into pretzel knots, um, you know, in order to try to justify this. We have ongoing processes, and we still have these processes that are going on, and those processes are ongoing. I mean, it's like, it it comes a point where, I, I don't know how he continues to show up to these press briefings. I mean, how do you continue to make excuses for what is obviously a genocide at this point? So, I'll try to have more videos for you guys tomorrow. Again, apologies for, uh, for being sick today and everything, but um, hopefully that was uh, somewhat illuminating in terms of a little bit of an update. And, um, you know, again, I'll have, I'll have more for you guys tomorrow.